welcome. Thank you for being here at the 2017 JSU Student Symposium, and we are ready to kick off the morning with Ms. Jennifer Foster, student, and she is going to introduce their talk. And uh, she was in the Old Testament class last semester, and she took the classes honored by contract. So this was part of her contract. So um, she is going to be presenting about Joab's death in First Kings today. Joanna? Okay. Um, if you ever read the story of David in 2 Samuel and beginning of 1 Kings, then you'll see one name pop up again and again, which is Joab, David's commander. He's not really someone you hear of when you actually learn of David in the, as a kid, because a lot of stuff he did is really messy, and he's a lot connected to some of the worst stuff in David's story. But, okay, a brief summary of him is, Joab was actually David's nephew. He was the son of one of David's sisters. And he served as David's commander for several years, but then near the end of his life, near the end of David's life, he ordered Solomon to have Joab killed. He told him to not let him die peacefully. And Joab tried to get asylum at the altar, but Solomon actually had him killed there in the temple. During his time as commander, he basically has three main things that stand out as his worst actions. He ambushed and killed a man named Abner in revenge for Abner killing his Joab's brother in battle, but David explicitly told him not to mess with Abner. He carried out David's plan to have Uriah the Hittite killed after, after David had an affair with Uriah's wife Bathsheba. And he killed Absalom, which was David's eldest son, explicitly against David's wishes for anyone to touch him when Absalom was revolting. So he basically kept going against David, but he also sometimes obeyed David. And it kind of leads to the question of why David had him executed and really why he treated Joab like that at all. So the main thing I'm going to be focusing on is when David actually cursed Joab after killing Abner, how Joab's death came so late in the story, and what happened when he tried to get asylum at the temple. So in 2 Samuel 3, 28 through 29 in the ESV, David says, I and my kingdom are forever guiltless before the Lord for the blood of Abner and the son of Ner. May it fall upon the head of Joab and upon all his father's house. And may the house of Joab never be without one who has a discharge or one who is leprous or who holds a spindle or who falls by the sword and who lacks bread. Basically an extremely severe curse, but one of these things are not like the others. It's pretty normal to curse someone with death, poverty, and sickness, but it's not normal to curse someone to hold a spindle. And that, the word for spindle here is actually kolek, which is an extremely rare word in the Hebrew Bible. And it basically is translated as either spindle or crutch, depending on which Bible you're using. The assumption with the spindle is because the spindle is part of a weaving loom, then the weaving looms were associated with women because weaving was considered women's work. Then David was cursing Joab's family to have effeminate men who would no, be no good for war. But um, as uh, Stephen Holloway pointed out, it is actually common for another culture at that time to punish traitor soldiers by making them dress as women. There's no evidence that this practice existed in the uh, Israelite culture, and it would be really odd for him to say, I hope you all have violent deaths, and then make a really euphemistic reference to effeminate men. So the other translation of it being a crutch, that kind of may be plausible, but other phrases for crutch have been used throughout the Bible, so it would be really weird for them to use this extremely rare word for crutch instead of using a more common phrase. But Holloway points out that in the word polek actually occurs in other context in the Bible, and that's in Nehemiah 3, 1 through 32, when it's talking about rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. And in that context, polek is understood to mean work parties, districts, or conscripted labor, people who were forced to work for the Israelites. And that actually ties in a lot to the context of the culture we're talking about. In their time, conscripted labor was something absolutely horrible. It was the worst thing you could do. It was why the Israelites kept conquering other peoples and making them work. And it's why the Israelites suffered under Solomon's peaceful reign, because without any wars to take prisoners, and they didn't have anybody to build the temple, but they're all in the Israelites. So in this, if you interpret it this way, then it actually makes much more sense. So what David was cursing 
Joab's family was to be hard laborers who would be like the worst of the worst in Israelite culture. And given that Joab was an army commander and that armies were usually used to take prisoners, then it would be ironic for him to curse Joab with this faith. So the general conclusion here is that he was actually, instead of cursing Joab's family to be crippled or effeminate, he was cursing them to be hard workers. Okay, the next one is how long it took him to actually have Joab killed. It's really odd how long he put this off because David did not really have a good relationship with Joab for most of his time as commander. He actually tried to replace Joab with a man named Amasa, but Joab killed Amasa and basically forced David to give him his role back because his, command, his previous commander was dead. So one possibility is that because when David was near death, Joab allied with Adonijah, who was David's oldest living son, instead of Solomon, and tried to put Adonijah on the throne, then maybe that was the last straw for David. But when David says that Joab shall be killed, he actually referred to the deaths of Abner and Amasa, not the whole Adonijah situation. According to J.W. Wesselis, there was too much time here for this to really be a good excuse for Joab's execution. But there's a, another idea with uh, how the deaths are, how the excuse is so explicit. He points out that basically if you read the Bible, you'll notice that a lot of events that get extremely little detail to them. You kind of just gloss over things rather quickly. So he believes that the reason that this, these excuses were given so much detail was so that it, they would overstress and point to something that was actually bigger going on. And he believes what was bigger was what the author himself was trying to convey through this uh, narrative rather than David. So instead of being this excuse, he believes that when you look at the narrative itself, this, uh, the narrative of David's reign is basically symmetrical. It centers around it, the clash between David's forces and Absalom's forces during his revolt. So if you look before Absalom's revolt, you see Nathan appearing in the story of Bathsheba. If you look after his revolt, you see Nathan appearing when Solomon succeeds to the throne. If you look before the revolt, you see Joab working with a so-called wise woman to bring Absalom back to the city. After the revolt, and after uh, Absalom is killed and Sheba revolts, then David, then after, Joab works with another wise woman to have Sheba beheaded. So if you continue this mirroring, then the only event that really mirrors Joab's death is the death of Uriah the Hittite, which was also the only murder he was involved in that wasn't really justified through some other means. Because in both cases, a woman is transferred from one man to another. In the first case, it was Bathsheba being given to David. And in the second case, it was David's virgin wife being given to his son Adonijah. So in the first case, Joab actually helped by having Uriah killed in battle. But in the second case, he himself was killed for what he did trying to give the virgin wife to Adonijah. So in this, basically, Joab's death was seen as a punishment for helping with the murder of Uriah is seen as the end of Uriah's death story because so much of David's narrative is the consequence of what happened with Uriah. Okay, the last point is when Joab flees to the temple. In Exodus 21, 12 through 14, in the ESV, it says, Whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. But if he did not lie and wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place to where he may flee. But if a man willfully attacks another to kill him by cunning, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. A lot of people connect this to the story of Joab fleeing to the altar and believe it's the re reasoning behind why he did that. But it's seen as made like, as Jonathan Burnside points out, biblical law is meant to, meant to be narrative rather than literal. So if you try to interpret this law really literally, you'll miss part of the point. So he believes that the laws are meant to provide a case example for if someone does something similar to this, this is how you should treat them. It's really up to interpretation rather than being literal. So the Israelites had to consider how close the crime in question was to the case to determine whether or not to apply the law. And he believes that when you look at it this way, then anyone who feared being killed for something they had accidentally done could go to the temple and get sheltered there. But if you were the less like the further you away, the further away you were from the example, then the less likely you were to get asylum, but also the less likely you were going to be killed in the exchange. So, when around the time that or actually before Joab fled, Adonijah, the again the guy who's trying to usurp the throne, actually fled to the temple himself, 
but he was saved by Solomon. Solomon did not have him killed. So according to that, he must have been close enough to the example case to actually be saved instead of uh, dying there. And, th and in this case, it's, he, had, he apparently did not fit the premeditated illegitimate murderer. But Joab himself actually had committed illegitimate murder, again, or premeditated murder. Again, he's the one who laid in wait to kill Abner. So he was closer to the illegitimate asylum seeker. And he had committed these murders wrongfully. So in this case, the law basically was interpreted in two different ways, depending on whether or not it was premeditated. So to sum it all up, Joab's story is really set in how the Israelite culture itself works, and you kind of have to look in the background to figure out what was the reasoning behind how he was treated. And it kind of it, it illustrates how when it comes to the Bible, you can't really just read things at face value and expect to really understand it. You kind of have to go deeper to see what all was the meaning behind things, and also Hebrew is hard to translate. <laughs> so, basically, if you ever want to get like a really good example of how to interpret things, then focus on the story of Joab. Joab. Thank you.